judges, would you please introduce yourselves? Good evening. My name is Becca Steinhoff. I am joining from Casper, Wyoming. I am the executive director of the John P. L. Bogan Foundation and am delighted to be here with you and hear your remarks this afternoon. And Hello, everyone. I, oh, go ahead, Marsha. Okay. I forgot the order. Up. Oh. Um, I'm Scott, Scott Barnhart. I'm an attorney here in Indianapolis, Indiana. I work for the Indiana Attorney General's Office. Uh, I do consumer protection law. I'm looking forward to hearing your remarks. And I'm Marsha Holland. I'm also an attorney, but from Missoula, Montana. I was a career public defender in Alaska and then moved back to Montana where I teach at the law school. And just last week, I finished my ninth Zoom mock trial. So I'm really excited to be able to hear from you and, and you know that this technology allows us to continue with this competition. So thank you so much for being here. And students, please introduce yourselves and your teacher, any coaches and mentors you had. Hi, my name is Sophia Gozigian. Well, my name is Sakil Barasa. My name is Caitlin Nagatomo. I'm Abigail Merhige. We are all sophomores at Cottonwood Classical Preparatory School in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And this is our teacher, Mr. Bill Torres. Well, thanks for being here. This is unit six, and we will hear from you today. Question number one. Thomas Hobbes noted that life in a state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. How has the human condition changed over time? And how is that change reflected in our expectations of government? Should the principles of natural rights or classical republicanism guide policy changes designed to improve the condition of all people? What are the most pressing domestic and global challenges facing Americans today and in the future? What policies can you suggest to address them? You may begin. Aristotle once said, if the whole body be destroyed, there'll be no foot or hand. The body is representative of the common good and the hand and foot are representative of our self-interest. That being said, over the course of time, humans have proven themselves to be naturally self-centered beings. Their government should be a source for people to rely on in order to promote the common good, since people cannot be accounted to have civic virtue without being taught to them. As humans have drifted apart from each other, the role of government has become even more crucial as it helps us move further away from Hobbes' Buddhist state of nature. The principles of global republicanism and natural rights are fundamental in improving the condition of all people. But if we over-prioritize one, we must not forget the other. It can be argued that introducing more classical republicanism would further guide policy changes designed to improve the condition of all people. In order to do this, we need more civic virtue, moral education, and small uniform societies. In order to do this, we would, uh, just because we can't have one universal common good, doesn't mean you can't utilize the principles of classical republicanism. John Locke's natural right philosophy argues that the individual self is what we must be most concerned with rather than the common good. However, we argue that there's some overlap between the two. Classical Republican requires a level of civic participation that is connected to the enlightened self-interest in a multitude of ways. Paying taxes for a public education is an example of enlightened self-interest. While the individual has to sacrifice a portion of their wages, society as a whole benefits from it because education advances the interests of everyone in the community. We have seen the debate regarding people's individual rights versus the common good when it comes to mask wearing and health regulations. The argument made for the refusal of mask wearing has become one parallel to the concept of individual right. And while the First Amendment does guarantee the freedom of speech, this freedom does not apply to masks as they are a way not only to protect yourself individually, but to protect the safety of others around you. When you promote the common good now by following public health guidelines and wearing masks properly, the quicker, the quicker our individual rights and interests can resume to normal. However, by prioritizing our individual rights now, we threaten the common good and risk harming the lives of others. With 3.09 million deaths worldwide and climbing, one of the most concerning international matters for the U.S. is the coronavirus. The world was and still is unprepared for a pandemic. According to the Commonwealth Fund, one third of U.S. adults went without recommended care, did not see a doctor when sick, or filled or failed to fill out a prescription because of costs. America has been hit hard by the pandemic. Unaffordable health care and unemployment have only added to the problem. How the world faces and prevents more health crises is directly linked to access to clean water. This global issue is one that is highly connected to the US through global quality and firsthand domestic experience. 
While from the surface, this may not seem relevant to the bigger issues of the world, it is imperative to recognize that a country's access to clean drinking water is an interconnecting force of other major issues pertaining to the US, including equality of all kinds, economic stability, and global healthcare. As said by the ICF, water issues are highly political. Women are disproportionately affected because gender roles put them in charge of tasks that expose them to unsafe water. It is essential to know that water is a socioeconomic and human rights issue, which causes huge inequalities between first and third world countries. One of the four main ideas of international law pertaining to the U.S. is the respect for human rights, thus proving an obligation for us to tackle this global issue. However, the U.S. is not immune to those same struggles. Look to the water crisis in Flint, Michigan and the aftermath of the severe weather conditions in Texas. Possible policies to address current and future healthcare accessibility include creating programs to ensure that everyone has equal access to good health care and services at free or affordable prices. Programs that invest in community resources to promote preventative measures should be prioritized as well. In terms of water accessibility, increased federal regulation and funding of water conservation efforts should be at the forefront of policies passed to help ensure clean drinking water within and beyond the U.S. As we have seen with the current world situation, people have and always will remain highly dependent on government to help provide for and protect the common good as well as our individual rights. While the founders argued that citizens are self-sufficient individuals with a limited need for government, we argue that the government should be there to aid the people in their pursuit of the common good through civic responsibility should they need it. So, so what role does the government play with respect to moral education? You mentioned that in your opening statement. So what, is, what does moral education look like to you? Well, to me, moral education, well, to everyone, is constantly changing. So the government will just have to kind of, we can teach it in public schools, but it will have to change according to the time period and what's commonly accepted. I think another great example of moral education is this class, We the People, and the curriculum we're taking itself as we are learning how to be civically engaged in our country and in our society. And I think if this was more accessible to more students across the country, since we are in our most formative years of learning, then that would be a great example of the government providing this for students. So let me ask a, what might seem to be an unrelated question, but actually related. We're living in increasing times of polarization and you know, different groups of people are just really not listening to the other side. So does education play a role in helping everyone to at least be able to listen to the other side or should the government step in and reinstate say the um, free, um, freedom doctrine which allows radio stations, TV stations, news stations, you have to put the other point of view on in addition to the point of view you want your readers or listeners to listen to. Do you have any thoughts about how to resolve the polarization? I do think public education is one of the driving factors that should be helping with polarization because we do have the freedom of speech in this country and people should be able to express their ideals freely. However, we need to be able to also know how to listen to each other. And I think if we were to learn that more early on in uh, public schools, then we wouldn't have the, so much polarization issues later on in life because we were all taught to do that earlier on. And that would still allow us to preserve that freedom of speech under the First Amendment. And I think this goes back to the idea that although we can't have small uniform tasks, we can um, further this idea of common good through um, civic education, just like my colleagues have said through this We the People class. So although we might not be able to enforce other ideas and work for this common good, I think education is how we will get there. Um, I also think it's important to remember that um, the times have changed, and especially in the age of social media, um, where it's extremely divisive and people can say whatever they want to without really any repercussions. It's important to educate our students and our youth and everyone just in general um, about like the, the, both the pros and the cons of social media and how that affects our points of views. Thank you. So to kind of, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Can I go ahead? Okay, so. Just to kind of wrap that all up, I think what my colleagues are trying to say is that if we teach our like kids in the future to be more tolerant at a younger age, we'll be able to become closer and less polarized. Thank you. 
You also mentioned civic participation um, in, in your essay, which will I, I want to talk a little bit more about. Um, so how do we make sure that all voices are, are represented or that there's equal access to civic participation um, in a way that would lead to advancing interests for all? So ensuring that we have that perspective um, and that we're actually capturing what is the best interest for everyone. Well, I think that's a really compelling point, especially since the Constitution was written at a time where, you know, people were excluded from the common good, such as, you know, African Americans and women. And so I think one way of making sure that everybody has equal opportunity to make their voices heard through voting is by tackling uh, voter suppression. So making sure that people are able to take the time off from their jobs to actually go and make their uh, vote cast and also making sure that there are equal number of polling stations for every community. And I think that's a really great way to start in making sure everyone has equal opportunity opportunity to engage in civic uh, participation. Is technology an asset or a burden to addressing these issues that you've been discussing? I believe that technology is an asset in many ways um, because we see um, a lot of especially division between like these uh, popular cities and then rural counties and um, rural places. And so the ability for or technology to be able to reach all of these um, rural places really helps uh, with getting um, news spread and uh, just learning more how like you can participate um, in uh, like voting. On the other hand, I, it could also be something that drives us apart, which it kind of does because when you kind of, when you go to social media, you are in your own bubble you see what you believe in and not none of the other side. So that can kind of just tear us apart too. I would have to agree with my colleague on this one. And also considering that since we've seen this um, social, social media become more and more popular, suicide rates have also gone up. So I think it can drive us apart. And like my colleague is saying, we're on social media, we see what we wanna see, or we can, we can see, we can stick to the parts of social media that support our own ideas. So I think although we can spread messages through social media, I think it can also have the opposite effect. And so let me ask a related question. Um, given the power of social media, we can see what's going on in Myanmar. We can see things that are going on in Afghanistan. We can now almost be there when things are happening in real time. Do you think the United States should play an enhanced role in maintaining relationships with um, countries where their citizenship is not being treated the way we would hope our citizenship would be treated, or should we take a step back and not engage with those countries? I think social media is an excellent outlet to do this. Um, and I think one way is just awareness in general for the general population to be able to know what's going on in these different areas and to be able to put more pressure on the federal government to uh, sort of improve conditions there. And I think this is a really also great option because in terms of things you know, like military intervention where it could escalate issues, I think social media and technology is a really great alternative to that to help increase uh, democracy in other areas of the world. Thank you. You noted some ideas that um, were both global and domestic, uh, clean water and the coronavirus. And so do you have any guidance for us on how we strike a balance um, or what it looks like to meet the needs of our individuals domestically versus having a more global approach? I think the water example is perfect in this regards because it is one that both affects us uh, globally and domestically. And I think if we start to enact policies domestically, then we will be able to increase that um, and increase funding globally as well. And so this is just one issue where we can do both at the same time. Also, dealing off of that, the water issue, if the US takes lead, other countries like our allies could possibly follow our lead and enact policies that further their water. Um, additionally, I believe that um, by tackling the domestic uh, water issues, we can then... Um, oh. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, everyone. Yes, thank you. We'll give some comments now um, and let you 
get on to the next thing. So thank you uh, very much for your um, preparation and your insights. We heard some things from you that we hadn't heard before, uh, which is always really exciting at this point in the day. In particular, um, I'm just really astounded by and um, left thinking about this idea around clean water. Um, so we've heard a lot about the environment and, and similar issues as you might imagine, but not um, that one. And so I think it's, it's really intuitive and insightful of you to connect the dots um, between that particular issue and some of what else might be happening um, both domestically and globally. Um, I, I think if I had one uh, suggestion, I think you could do a little bit more to integrate some additional examples or evidence into what you cited. Um, you've offered a lot of really, I think, deep insight and you've tied it back very much so to what was in your beginning essay, but to have just a little bit more supporting evidence um, that you can offer up in some examples for some of what you're talking about um, would, would help just boost a little bit. Um, but in general, I think you um, very clearly prepared for um, connecting the dots from your original essay um, and wove those same themes and, and topics and content through your responses, which shows us a strong um, sense of coherence. Um, and that's always really great for us to be able to recognize that. So um, very well done. Thank you very much. Yeah, I agree. A deep insight, I think, is, is really applicable here. Um, I really appreciated your, your thoughts about, well, yes, we have the right to, to free speech, but we should probably be doing some more listening than speaking sometimes. Um, that was very insightful. I, I certainly appreciate that and, and the, the comments about tolerance as well. Um, I also appreciated your example of technology and how it might be more useful from a rural standpoint to more rural communities to pull them in. Uh, I think that's very helpful. I, if I had any criticism, I, I would um, take a little bit of issue with conflating moral education with civic education. I think I see, I, at least I see those two as slightly different. Uh, so I, I would uh, kind of think about that a little bit more, but your very, very um, uh, deep understanding of, of what's going on here, and I certainly appreciate that. So well done. I'll just add a few final comments. In your prepared remarks, you did a great job and a very thoughtful job. Uh, it looks like it was a team collaboration of explaining how the concepts that were presented in the question and the two bullet points below are intertwined. It's a really difficult question and you provided a really good structure for how the different concepts are intertwined in your comments and I really appreciated it. Um, two, we, it's interesting to see each, you know, each school's um, approach to this and you took a topic, clean water, and threaded, threaded it through everything you talked about in a way that connected it up with women's issues, with um, the pandemic, with so many things. And that's whoever came up with that particular approach. It was really effective because it shows us that there's some problem that's both at the national level and even at the state level. And your examples of Texas and Flint just really knocked it home for me that we can start right here. And then we can, you know, we think about maybe it was Africa, but really it starts, you know, next it, with our next door neighbors. And the one takeaway I'm going to come away from your presentation with in terms of inspirational comment of the day is we should teach kids how to listen earlier. What a great idea, just what a great idea. I really appreciate that, I don't know if it was something you planned on talking about, you know, specifically, but that is great insight into, we're, we're in a really polarized, you know, country right now. And that simple step could go so far. And then your final comments about global awareness is it, you really kind of brought it home at the very end with global awareness is really local awareness. It's really state awareness. It's really national awareness. So I, once again, that theme or that thread of connecting all the different concepts together, you started with that, you kept going through that, and then you ended with that. And so the only thing is if you, if there were one or two other examples like, you know, Texas and Flint and water, you know, it, it would have been just like a college level mock or, you know, presentation. So thank you so much for providing so much food for thought and for inspiring me. I really appreciate it.